Let's bow our head for prayer. Our Father, we come before you because we know you are a God of love and a God of grace as well as a God of mercy. We praise you because we know you have called us with a holy calling. And you have brought us near to yourself so as to cleanse us, change us, and transform our lives. And you make us to be part of the family of God. And in your family, you delight in purity and holiness. And Father, we are asking that what you teach us today will be part of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that we will not be as nominal Christians who just delight in coming to the presence of God to sing, to pray, to listen to the word, but without throwing their hearts into what they do. Make us true believers indeed. And help us to approach your word with a true approach. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we're looking at the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 5. It's a solemn passage of scripture, and you'll see why I call it a solemn passage of scripture as we get into it right now. It's the first occurrence of sin in the midst of a powerful revival that sprang up in the early church. Now, the revival continued. I just told you from chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 that it was a powerful church, a revived church. It was a church on the go. It was a church on fire. And because they were on fire, they were hot for the Lord. But then, in the midst of the revival, some wonderful things were taking place. The saints were sharing together. The saints were fellowshipping together. And the sharing and the fellowship was so deep that Many of them began to sell what they heard when they saw the need in the church and uh, they sold what they had and distribution was made to everyone as every man had a need. And we're told about a particular individual, his name, Joseph. So named by the apostles as Barnabas, we're told he too sold what he had and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. It was in the midst of such a sharing, fellowshipping, spirit-filled revival, spirit-inspired revival, that what we're reading about tonight in Acts chapter 5 actually took place. The fire was burning. The spirit was moving. The power was working. The flame was very hot. And people within the church, they knew this was a new move, a great move of the Holy Ghost. Miracles were taking place. Signs were happening everywhere. And in the fulfillment of the words of Jesus Christ, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall take up serpents. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. In my name if they drink any deadly thing, shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Those signs were taking place in their midst. And then we have the solemn story that we have in this chapter. You know, it's a pity that where the revival of God is working, you know, sometimes some people will not really believe the depth and the height and the breadth of the revival. They will think that, well, even though we know God is working, we may be able to, you know, sneak in some things that are not really righteous and holy. But you know, our Bible says that God is a consuming fire. He's a God of love. He's a God of power. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of all grace. But listen to me, he's also a God of judgment. And so we read from chapter 5. Let me just read it to you so you know where we're at. Acts chapter 5 from verse 1. But... Now, you know when a sentence starts with a but, there is a change in emphasis. When the Bible has been talking of the mighty revival that has been taking place, and then the new chapter is started with a but, then there is a change. It means that we're going now from the revival 
to another thing. We're going from the power of God. We're going from the miracles and the signs, the miracles of mercy, the signs of love. We're going from those things to another area entirely. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this sin in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in and Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. And Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost and the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth buried her by husband. Fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Now, that's a solemn story you've seen there and what I've read to you. Number one, there was a sinful pretense. But then there was spiritual perception from the apostle. Then there was swift punishment and then a solemn purging. Let's see verses 1 and 2. But a certain man named Ananias, talking about the grace of God, the meaning of his name, and Sapphira, meaning beautiful, his wife sold a possession. This couple, the husband, talking about the gracious God, and the wife, um, the name signifying the beauty of fellowship with God. Turned to be that uh, they were not gracious, neither were they beautiful in their character, Ananias and Sapphira, the wife. Uh, they saw that all the other people were selling possessions, and they were bringing the money to the apostle, and um, distribution was being made. And it appeared that the only way you could have uh, some notice, the only way you could gain some attention, was to do what everybody else was doing. And obviously they had been part of the church, a member of the church, or members of the church rather, going along with the church, fellowshipping with the church, studying with the church, sharing with the church, and also they were moved to partake of, you know, the sacrifice in the church also wanting to sell what they had so that distribution could be make, made to other people. But their motive was questionable. They allowed the devil to put something within them. And we are told in verse 2, they kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, that he is having a private consent a private agreement to it. 
and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. There was sin here. You know, it is possible in a church. I told you about this church before, the early church. I told you it was a saved church. When I was talking to you about the secrets of a growing church, saved, steadfast, sharing, sanctified, spirit-filled, second coming church. They believe the second coming of the Lord as well. And you know, I told you it was also a supplicating church that they were committed to praying. You think about it. Saved, sanctified, spirit-filled, steadfast and studying and sharing and second coming, believing the second coming of the Lord. And yet, in such a church where people professed the three definite Christian experiences and where people were sharing together in fellowship and in love, where the holiness of the Lord was exalted, there could be people that will come and pretend, have an approach of simple pretense. It happened in the early church. And you know, since that time, it has continued to happen in, listen to me, every church. And that is why people complain. Well, they say, well, I won't go to church because there are hypocrites in the church. Listen to me. It's true there are hypocrites in the church, but then the presence of a counterfeit is a signification that there is also the genuine. Ananias and Sapphira happen to prove themselves to be counterfeit, but then there are genuine men of God, children of God, saints in the fellowship. They had this sinful pretense. Now you say, what was their sin? Was it selfishness? Well, selfishness is a sin, but that is not the issue here. It wasn't that, well, they were commanded to bring everything. If you don't bring everything, you are committing a sin. No, 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 not at all. In fact, the Apostle Peter said, While it remained, was it not your own? Was it not in thy own power? Which means there was no force about it to have brought everything. So the issue was not just selfishness. Well, was it not because they did not lay all on the altar? Well, not quite. The issue wasn't they wanted everybody to bring everything that he had. They were not compelling anyone to lay all their money, all their possession on the altar. It was all voluntary. What does uh, the Bible say in 2 Corinthians chapter 9? It says, God loveth a cheerful giver. If there be a willing mind first, then it is accepted. And therefore, it was to be a willing offering, a cheerful offering. But then, uh, the problem was not just not laying out on the altar. The problem wasn't just selfishness. It was the pretense. Basically, it was the line, the hypocrisy, creating a false impression that was really the wrong thing. How many times some people create a wrong impression of being on top when they are down, of being holy when they are unholy, of uh, being righteous when they are unrighteous. You know what? It's even possible because of our caring attitude in the house fellowship system. You come to the zona leader and you know it's all pretense. You love the Lord. You have no work, and yet you have work. You have no money, and yet you have money. You're looking for, you know, some supply from the church. And you pretend as if, you know, you are so poor, you are so wretched, you have nothing at all. In fact, you are dying. Pretending to, you know, create a false impression so that something will be done. You know that's a sin before the Lord. You know, God hates hypocrisy. And the problem here was hypocrisy as well. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And see what the Lord has to say about hypocrisy. Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. 
Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Take heed, beware, that what you do, you are not doing it to make a show. You are not doing it to be seen of men. You are not doing it to buy a spiritual state or status or position in the church. You are not doing it to curry favor. You are not doing anything you are doing in the church so that, you know, men will clap for you, applaud you, and men will, you know, just speak about you in a wonderful way when you know that uh, that is not the truth about you. Because, you know, that will be hypocrisy. That will be simple pretense. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, sound not a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. Verse 5. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Hypocrisy is a great sin, and God condemns it. Christ condemns it. You cannot keep your genuine experience of salvation if you are hypocritical. If you're always wanting to buy a great name by what you say, what you do, by the way you project yourself, you know, it's not even right for you, for any reason, to project yourself. You should rather talk about other people rather than talk about yourself. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. For a pretense, that's hypocrisy. Therefore ye shall receive the greater condemnation. Hypocrisy will be judged by God. You know, sometimes you can hide hypocritical attitude, but you cannot hide it from God. In fact, somebody has said, a secret sin on earth is an open scandal before heaven. That means what we hide, what we cover on earth, and we keep or hold secret on earth is an open scandal before heaven. It's sin in heaven. In verse 25 of Matthew chapter 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but are within, full of dead men's bones, and of fall on cleanness. Even so are ye outward, uh, do ye, so ye appear outwardly righteous unto men. But within, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. They wanted the praise of men. Yet, they wanted to keep part of the money. They were desirous of self-glory. 
they wanted to be elevated in the minds of the in the minds of other people to gain prestige and to gain position of spiritual leadership but then it was a deliberate lie they had a purpose to deceive and because of that because of the simple pretense they came not under the praise of men but under the punishment of God you know they were looking for praise but they didn't get it they got, they got the very opposite but now let's look at Acts chapter 5 I've shown you in verses 1 and 2 the simple pretense of Ananias a member of the church and it's sounding a great warning to us today that we should beware of pretense, lying, hypocrisy, creating a false impression. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. We come to spiritual perception. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Let me explain this to you. Church administration is very difficult without the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And church administration will become business administration without the help of the Holy Ghost. Now, you must realize there are many, many places where ministers of God, pastors, are called together to come and learn about how to control the church, guide the church, how to administer the church. And in many of those seminars that I've seen the write-ups, I've seen the uh, seminar books and the programming, you know, it has been all business teaching. You know, they teach them business management. They teach them how to control, how to, you know, uh, moderate the whole thing, how to get your facts, how to get your information. They teach a number of things to pastors. And uh, when pastors come with that load of earthly knowledge on administration and management, and they, you know, toss the Bible aside, and they do not have a deep, prayer life, a deep life in the spirit. You may be able to carry on to a particular stage with the knowledge you need on, you know, sociology and crowd control and many things like that. But then when it comes to spiritual things, you'll be at a loss. You'll not be able to know what to do. Think about it. If Peter at this time only depended upon lectures on business administration, if uh, Peter depended on, you know, just uh, using what you have got. In any case, uh, no worker in the church can be perfect, so make the best of the people you have. Hypocrisy would have gone unnoticed. Now, if Peter the apostle did not have the time to pray, if all he did was, you know, just read and read and read on sociology and management and science and many, many things, how to preach, how to control, how to raise up days, how to raise an offering, how to promote the church, if that was the only thing that Peter knew and he did not have time to have the gift of the Holy Ghost in his life, he would not have known. But you know, Peter had what we call spiritual perception. You know, in a church where the gifts of the Spirit are manifested, it's difficult for sin to be hidden indefinitely. And so Ananias came and he brought the money. And Peter immediately just looked at him. No magic in this, it's just the gift of the Spirit, the word of knowledge is the revelatory gift. And he just looked at him and said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You're keeping back part of the price of the land. That's spiritual perception. And today, God is working in his church just the same way. And it's wonderful when you belong to such a church. Now let me show you in the Bible. 
this gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's read from verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. That means the revelation of knowledge which you had not been told physically to another by the same spirit faith to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues and to another interpretation of tongues but all these workers that one and self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will you know when god calls a minister a pastor a prophet or an evangelist he gives the necessary gifts to go along with the work and when god called peter and john and matthew and andrew and all the other apostles he gave them the gifts to be able to accomplish the work effectively and so you have the spiritual perception. Daniel tells us this quality of God. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel was a man that had such a gift. You remember when Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten his dream. And he was troubled because he had forgotten. Daniel said that he should be given time. And that he will pray and it will be revealed. And as he prayed with his companions in uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. You hear that? There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Verse 29. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed what should come to pass hereafter and he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass that tells us about the quality or the character of God in verse 47 Nebuchadnezzar now recognized the fact the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. So you can see then that the God of the patriarchs of old and the prophets of old the same God is the God of the preachers of today if the preachers will wait upon the Lord the Lord will help them to have this spiritual perception come back to Acts chapter 5 verses 3 and 4 now and Peter said Ananias why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Do you know that Ananias thought that he was dealing with just ordinary man? He didn't know that he was dealing with a man full of the Holy Ghost. And that this man, Peter the Apostle, could see into the pretense, into the lying. Let me show you some passages of the Old Testament. To see that this was not a new thing. The revelation of secrets in church administration. In Second Kings chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 20. But Gehazi, 
the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman, the Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is it is all well? And he said, All is well. My master have sent me. You hear that? Elisha did not send him. It's possible for those who are even close to the prophets of God, ministers of the gospel, to slip off from their ground and stage of grace and just go off for some time and sin. And you know, this man Gehazi said, My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of, of garments. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him, and he bound two talents of silver in two bags, and uh, with two changes of garments, and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bear them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand, and uh, bestowed them in the house. And he let the, he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. Now you can see the pretense there again. Covetousness came into Gehazi. And uh, he went, and it was not to the physical knowledge of Elisha, the man of God. But you realize that Elisha, the man of God, the prophet, had the gift of the Spirit in his life. And the God that reveals secrets was very close in relationship and fellowship with Elisha. And as he asked Gehazi, saying, Where have you gone? And he told the lie, saying, Well, I didn't go anywhere. Look at the next verse. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money, and to receive garments, and olive yards, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and maid servants? And you see that, that Elisha knew, because the Lord revealed to him, I told you before, that church administration will be very, very difficult without that gift. You know, especially in a large church like this. In 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14 from verse 1. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam. Get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, who told me that I should be king over this people, and take with thee ten loaves and cracknels, and a cruise of honey, and go to him, and he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose, and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set or dim by reason of his age. Now look up at me here. It is possible 
for a prophet of God to have physical predicament, deformity, handicap. This man of God, Ahijah, the prophet, had dim eyes. If there were glasses in those days, I believe we'll be wearing glasses. But then, you know, his eyes were so dim he couldn't recognize people. And yet, the eyes of his spirit were very sharp. The king Jeroboam told his wife, he said, now our child is sick. I am very evil. That's what he was telling the wife. If you go to the prophet and he knows that you are my wife, he may not want to tell you the mind of the Lord because of the evil I have done. So disguise yourself. Put on another type of clothing so that he will not recognize you. In any case, he's almost blind. He won't know anything. Just go to him and say, well, you are a woman from another place and uh, you need uh, information, revelation about what will happen to this child. But the revelatory gifts will not allow such a disguise or pretense to go unnoticed. Look at verse 5. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a sin of thee for her son. For his sake. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her. For it shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign or pretend or disguise herself to be another woman. Before she got to the prophet, to the man of God, the Lord said, The wife of so and so is coming. He, she'll pretend. But she is so and so. And this is the question she would ask. And this is the answer you will give. Verse 6. So it was. When I heard the sound of her feet. As she came in at the door. That he said. Come in. Thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Now you see, it's not possible to hide sin indefinitely in a church where the Holy Ghost is moving. Because the Lord will reveal by His Spirit. A few weeks ago, somebody who had been living in immorality, you know, came. I had disciplined that uh, woman since uh, a long time. And uh, some six, nine months had passed. And you know, she came, you know, she got her to come for counseling, like other people came for counseling. And you know, she sat down and then said, uh, I've come to see you. And I said, it's all right. And she said, well, we've been on discipline for such a long time. Uh, you know, myself and uh, brother so and so. And uh, because this is a large church, we think you may be forgetting us. And uh, after all, you know, we love the Lord since that time. We have been coming to fellowship and uh, we just don't want to leave this church. We love this church. I looked at her and I said, I want to ask you a question. She said, all right, sir. I said, oh, say, God make a blind man the pastor of his church. He said, no. I said, well, if that is what you believe, I am not a blind man. I can see. Now, you have committed fornication after I disciplined you and stopped you from doing what you were doing. You've done it not once, not twice. And I looked straight at her eyes and she started weeping. And started telling me that they have gone into sin about six times since they were disciplined. And you know, she came before me wanting me to forget about the discipline and to restore them because, you know, they love the church. They love the children of God. They don't want to go to another church. They just want to remain in this place. So why are you just going to keep on disciplining us like that? But you know, when the Spirit of God is moving in a church, it's not possible to deceive the pastor indefinitely. And you know, sometimes you may not understand when people are disciplined, but that's not your business. Because the pastor may know more than you know. In fact, the people under discipline may not know that uh, the pastor knows what he knows about them. So when people are undisciplined, just keep your mouth shut. Now in Acts chapter 5, you've seen the spiritual perception of um, Peter the apostle. And now we go to the swift punishment 
In Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. You know, judgment came immediately. It was a swift punishment. She came in for praise, but he got punishment. He came in wanting to have, you know, the clapping of the church, saying Ananias and Sapphira, they are just wonderful, wonderful people. That they have given so much to the church. Now look up at me here. Church administration is very, very difficult. Very difficult. You know, some pastors, if they see Ananias this way, even if they knew that Ananias was telling a lie, they'll think about it this way. Well, he has even brought part of the money. And uh, the part that remains, he has not spent it. The money is still there. If we, you know, correct him, encourage him, if we praise him for the little he has done at least, you know, great things start in a small way. A person may start with a little consecration and he can end up with a great consecration. And since he has given just this amount, which is still a substantial amount, the price of land or property that was sold, well, if we just encourage him, by the time we make announcement next Sunday, he'll bring in another, a little part again. By the time there was another need, he'll bring in a little part again. And so, well, let's just make do with what we have. You know, that is what human beings will think when they are running the church with common sense, not with the Holy Ghost. But Peter just looked straight at him and said, You have lied not unto men, you have lied unto God. You know, when you tell a man of God a lie, you are lying unto God. When you tell the pastor of the church a lie, because the pastor of the church is representing God, you are actually lying unto God. And he died. And the young men, without wasting time, just bound him up and they just went to bury him. Then in verse 7, and it was about the space of three hours when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. You know, I was surprised when I read that verse. What surprised me? This was a large church. Because at this time, they were just in their multitudes. Just in multitudes. All over the town, you see members of this church in Jerusalem. And this thing had happened. That this man, Ananias, had died. One hour went, two hours went, three hours went, and there was nobody in the whole church gossiping to go to the wife and say, ah, you know what is happening? They have killed your husband. Peter, ah, you killed, her. You killed him. Just right up. No mercy, no love, no grace, nothing whatever. Your husband came in and right, your husband is dead. Go and check up. The wife did not know anything. There was nobody gossiping in that large church of thousands of people. That's a real church. You know, if a little thing happens in the church, in one zone, that um, somebody is having a problem, all the other zones have already known. If something is uh, not announced yet and, uh, you know, it's about to be done, some of the zonal leaders themselves, they have uh, gossiped and they have talked about it. But, you know, in this church, the discipline was carried out and it was a divine judgment from above. But there was nobody gossiping about it. I say that is a spiritual church. You check up whether you are spiritual as that. Now, verse 8. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me, whether you sold the land for so much? And she said, yes, for so much. I'm in agreement with my, with my husband. It's good to be agreed on what is right. It's wrong to be agreed on what is evil. We should not hide sin, cover sin. We should not have an agreement with a friend on wanting to cover sin. It's wrong to do it in the church. Now in verse 9, Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together 
to tempt the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband at the door, and it shall carry thee out. And she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. A swift punishment. Come back to second Kings that I read to you before. Second Kings chapter five. Gehazi had told his own lie. He had uh, brought forth his own sinful pretense. Let's see what came on him. Verse twenty six. Second Kings five. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee? When the man turned again with his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants and the leprosy? Sorry, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and uh, unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. Immediate judgment. Uh, you see, the word of God is full of warning for us. Now, what did this do to the church? Now, listen to me. The church could have murmured against Peter as if he had done this against Ananias and Sapphira. But they didn't murmur. They just kept quiet. They knew it was a solemn purging. They knew that it was a lie against God and it was God himself that brought the punishment oh yes he needed to use the mouth of Peter as his instrument but it was God himself it was an immediate stroke of divine vengeance or divine judgment we learn a lesson from that whatever is happening to anyone in the church will you just give it to the Lord we should not murmur or grumble against the minister in the, in the church, against the pastor or the workers in the church, as if the pastors are well, they, are just, they just discipline anybody the way they like. We should be very careful because, you know, we don't understand the ways of God. We don't know what God is doing. They didn't murmur. And now, they could have accused Peter of something. Now, this is very important. Listen to me. Do you know Peter himself? When Jesus was going to die, when he was being betrayed, you know the sin of Peter? Lying. Peter, he lied. He said, I never knew Jesus Christ. And he lied three times. And he, when Jesus looked back at him, he started weeping and God forgave him. You know, some people who know much about history, the history of Peter, the old members of the church, they could have said, ah, ah, why is Peter doing like this? God forgave him when he told a lie three definite times. And this man, Ananias, told a lie only once. Look at what Peter has done. You know, we should be very careful. When you know the history of the preacher, the history of the pastor, you know, you're likely to just say, well, I know that uh, Peter had his own lying problem before. So if God forgave him, why is he not forgiving Ananias and Sapphira? You know, this wasn't the problem of Peter at all. It was just punishment coming from God. Another problem I see here is this. Some members of the church will go around and they will say, okay, now Ananias, dead. Sapphira, dead. Their money is now in Peter's hand. What are they going to do with the money? You know, they'll be going about, okay, we know that God is punishing sin. God doesn't want sin. God wants holiness, holiness, holiness. Okay, holiness. How about the money Ananias put down? Who is going to spend it? Do you know there was no question in the church? 
You know, if it were today, people will be going around. They are very inquisitive. What will they do with the money that these men have brought? It was nobody's business. Because church administration ought to be the problem of God and his own ministers. We thank the Lord for such a church like this because fear came upon all the church. Look at verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. No gossiping, no murmuring, only fear. A purged church is a powerful church. When sin is punished in the church and the people have godly fear, the power of God flows freely. Now I've just told you something. That the people did not murmur. The people did not grumble. The people did not complain. Let me show you in the Old Testament a similar case. But then the children of Israel did differently. In uh, Numbers chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 31. This is about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all her goods. They and all that appertained to them went now alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round, the, round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. And there came a fire from the Lord, and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. That was purging also. Punishment coming upon the people that are done wrong. But now look at verse 41. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. You know, God was dealing with sin. There was no way that Moses could have opened the ground to make the ground to swallow a Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and all the people that uh, were in agreement with their sin. There was no way that Moses could do that. But it was God that did it. As judgment. Oh yes, he will use this man. He will use Moses, or he may use Aaron to speak the word out or to uh, put the discipline on whoever is offending in Israel or in the church. He will use somebody, his minister in particular, but then it's the work of God. But then on the morrow, all the congregation, you know, they gathered around and he began to say, well, Moses, okay, do the work of God alone. Go and do it alone yourself. You have killed the people of God. And verse 42, it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation. And behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. But then the punishment started because in verse 49 now they that died in the plague were 14,700 because of the murmuring saying that Moses and Aaron had killed the people of the Lord more than 14,000 almost 15,000 died because of that murmuring you see in the early church there was nothing like that Come back to Acts chapter 5, verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church. 
and upon as many as heard these things. You know, when somebody is disciplined in the church, it should bring fear upon the rest of the members of the church. And when judgment comes upon anyone, it should bring fear upon everybody else. But listen to me, God is a gracious God. You know too well that God is a merciful God. He doesn't kill everybody. Neither does he just retain his anger forever. All he does is just to make us to know or to remember that God is a consuming fire. And that if we run to God and we rush for his grace, the Lord will forgive. The Lord will show mercy. But that's only if we come. You know that even now, if you have been sinning, and yet you've been a worker, and you've been hiding the sin, and it appears that you are getting away with it, you know what you should do? Before the judgment of God comes, you should just go to the Lord and tell the Lord to forgive and to cleanse. Because if we we'll go to God, it's a merciful God. Very, very merciful. But then after we have been forgiven, we stop the sinning. We do not continue in sin that grace may abound. We have learned much today. Sinful pretense. Pre pretense is evil and bad in the church and anywhere. Spiritual perception. The ministers of the gospel should go before the Lord and they should have the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, they will not be able to guide and help and manage the church. Then there is punishment on sin. If we don't repent and there is solemn purging in his church, let us rise up and pray. This is the church of God. And God will not allow you to ruin the church with sin, murmuring, grumbling, immorality, fornication, adultery, covetousness, pretense, or hypocrisy. And if you have been living in sin secretly, it's time for you to repent and to call upon the Lord so that he will forgive. Because you know our God is a consuming fire. Oh yes, he judges. And God is no respecter of persons. If you sin, he'll judge. If you fail to repent, if you refuse to repent, And pretenders shouldn't just come into a church like this, refuse to repent and refuse to be saved. Just coming in and out in the church of God. Because God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. To repent, God is merciful. God is gracious.